Great. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I'm Joe Eisenhower. I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration here at the University of Detroit Mercy. And it's really a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to talk to you about something I find really interesting. Uh, the topic is Catherine McCauley, Social Entrepreneurship and Education for the Mercy Mission. You know, the founders of religious organizations uh, have not been widely recognized as business leaders or entrepreneurs or even social entrepreneurs, but that's exactly what many of them were. And in particular, I'd say Catherine McCauley was one of history's greatest social entrepreneurs long before the term social entrepreneur was even in our vocabulary. The presentation will have three parts. First, we'll describe social entrepreneurship and examine Catherine McCauley's career as a social entrepreneur. Uh, I'll piece together insights from her own letters, from memoirs of her contemporaries, and from her biographers. Second, we'll consider the legacy that she has bequeathed to us through the Sisters of Mercy. And third, I'd like to discuss what it means for business education at Mercy campuses today. So let's start with a little bit of background. I think the idea of entrepreneurship is fairly well understood. As examples of entrepreneurs, we can think of Henry Ford or Steve Jobs creating innovative new products that transform society. Typically, these entrepreneurs seek to be well rewarded for their initiative and risk taking. But the concept of social entrepreneurship is much newer. It's been around in the literature for about 20 years. And although a clear distinction between entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs is somewhat elusive, the consensus is that social entrepreneurs create new ventures targeted for the common good or ventures targeted toward the underprivileged. As examples of social entrepreneurs, we can think of Muhammad Yunus of Grameen Bank making micro loans to poor families in lesser developed countries, or the Reverend Edgar Helms, who collected used clothing and household goods, hired the unemployed to refurbish them, and sold them at Goodwill Industries. Now, Catherine McCauley was clearly a social entrepreneur in that sense. Granted, she may not have set out to be a business leader, but she didn't set out to found a religious organization either. She was born September 29th, probably in 1778 or perhaps 1781 in Dublin, and the year is uncertain. It's useful to remember that 18th century Irish Catholics had been persecuted by their government. By the time Catherine was born, Ireland had only partially repealed the Penal Code, a series of laws restricting Catholic ownership of property, careers, and even the practice or teaching of the faith. The laws had names such as the Act to Prevent the Further Growth of Popery. Not to be confused with the aromatic potpourri of dried flowers. <laughs> <laughs> potpourri was a derogatory term for Catholicism. And according to historian William Leckie, Irish Catholics were forbidden to serve in Parliament, deprived of the vote, excluded from being lawyers or judges or serving on juries. They could not be sheriffs or policemen. They were forbidden from possessing guns under the penalty of fines, imprisonment, or whipping and the pillory. They were excluded from the Army and Navy. They could not even possess a valuable horse. They could not attend a university or teach school or send their children to schools abroad. Upon their death, estates were divided equally among the sons, unless the eldest became a Protestant. And Catholics could not be the guardian of a child, so orphaned Catholic children had to be raised by Protestants. Now, although these laws were diminished and gradually repealed, their effects lingered. So poverty, unemployment, and illiteracy were rampant especially among widows and orphans. So it's not too surprising in this environment that Catherine's birth or baptism records are uncertain. We do know that her parents were James and Eleanor Magali, and different family members would use different spellings of the surname. 
Her father was a builder or carpenter, and he was modestly successful in real estate transactions. He's remembered for privately providing religious instruction to Catherine and charity to poor children. After Catherine's father died, biographer Sister Mary Sullivan notes, managing money was probably more than Eleanor Magali, a fashionable but financially inexperienced widow, could handle, which I think is a polite way of saying that mom kind of squandered the family savings. When her mother died, Catherine became dependent upon relatives and friends. She moved in with her mother's brother, but he also had financial problems. His granddaughter said he was given to dissipation and recklessness, and in less than a year, he was bankrupt. So Catherine again experienced poverty firsthand. For the next two decades, she lived with Protestant relatives and friends, ultimately moving in with well-to-do pharmacist William Callahan and his ailing wife to a 22-acre country estate called Kulak House. Now, because Mr. Callahan was occupied with his career and Mrs. Callahan was ill, Catherine was entrusted with the management of the estate, as well as with the distribution of the family's alms to poor people. So out of necessity, Catherine developed a strong business acumen, more reminiscent of her father than of her mother or her uncle. And in this sense, Kulak House would prove to be a training ground where Catherine would acquire financial and managerial skills. Upon Callahan's death in 1822, Catherine inherited the entire Callahan fortune. And although the precise magnitude is uncertain, it's often estimated to have been 25,000 Irish pounds. In today's money, after adjusting for inflation and exchange rates, it would be worth approximately 3.3 million US dollars. By any estimate, it's a large sum of money. And undoubtedly, Catherine didn't want to squander the Callahan fortune as her mother had done to their own estate. So in the words of biographers Regan and Kais, she summoned up all she had learned about the management of estates, of funds and great houses, as well as about the needs of single women and of the poor and the sick to carry out the stewardship of her inheritance. At this point, she made her first formal foray into commerce. She rented a house in Dublin, gathered the unskilled and unemployed girls who loitered around the neighborhood, and taught them needlework and sewing. She then opened a shop to sell the articles of women's clothing that they made and paid her pupils for their products. So she was running both a job training program and a rudimentary store. After liquidating the Callahan estate, Catherine set out to expand her social enterprise. She chose a plot of land on the corner of Bagot and Herbert Streets in Dublin, in a prominent section of the town, surrounded by the homes of the wealthy, but also by the back alleys and side streets where the poor lived. A friendly priest, Father Michael Blake, had suggested that location so that the works of mercy to be conducted there would be evident to the wealthy neighbors. Buying the property and building a house would have used up about a third to a half of the fortune. So instead, she leased the land for 150 years at 60 pounds per year. Now, to ensure that the community of well-to-do people would not be inconvenienced, the lease prohibited a long list of activities at the site, including, quote, a tavern, alehouse, soap boiler, chandler, baker, butcher, distiller, sugar baker, brewer, druggist, apothecary, tanner, skinner, lime burner, hatter, silversmith, coppersmith, pewter or blacksmith, or any other offensive or noisy trade." End quote. <laughs> but she did have a large house built there to serve as a shelter and training center for homeless young women, a school for poor girls, and a residence for women who would assist her in teaching and in visiting the sick.
On September 24th of 1827, which the church recognizes as the Feast of Our Lady of Mercy, the building was opened and dedicated as the House of Mercy. Sisters Joanna Regan and Isabel Keis note that at the House of Mercy, young hopefuls were trained in needlework, laundry, and other domestic services. <coughs> Success attended their efforts, and it soon became one of the busiest and most called upon employment agencies in Dublin. Young women were prepared to find employment as domestics or as assistants to dressmakers, confectioners, or other shopkeepers. The daily routine involved teaching two or three hundred girls each day, caring for the orphans who lived at the house, visiting the sick and dying in their homes or hospitals, providing a refuge for homeless girls and women, training them, and interviewing prospective employers for them. And now, you see, Catherine was simultaneously managing the personnel and finances of several business enterprises including a school and an employment agency. But remember, at this point, she was still a lay woman, more interested in social entrepreneurship than religious life. There was a chapel in the house, and a biographer, Father Roland Burke Savage, <coughs> states, hard work, prayer, and silence filled the day. And the observance was that of a religious community. And yet Catherine insisted that the ladies of Baggett Street were not, and never would be, religious, but were laywomen, free to come and go. He continues, Catherine made it a definite point that she would have nothing whatever to do with nuns. <laughs> and according to a memoir written by Catherine's contemporary, Sister Mary Vincent Hartman, the idea of founding a religious institute never entered her mind. Sister Mary Isidore Lennon explains that as a wealthy heiress, <coughs> Catherine's social position enabled her to mingle freely with influential people and thus bridge the chasm that existed between the Catholic Church and the wealthy. Regan and Keis add that distaste for the idea of convent life from perceptions acquired during long years within Protestant households was a reality for Catherine. As late as September 1828, she had reiterated in a letter to Reverend Francis Lestrange that the House of Mercy was to go on according to the original intention as a society of pious secular ladies who would devote themselves to the relief of suffering and the instruction of the ignorant. They would retain liberty to leave when they no longer felt inclined to render such service. But there were complaints that the House of Mercy was siphoning resources away from other established <coughs> religious orders, most notably the Sisters of Charity. So at the urging of the local clergy, and we can say moved by the Holy Spirit, she and two companions entered the convent of the Presentation Sisters in 1830 when Catherine was about 50 years old. And in December of 1831, they professed vows. They would be known as the Sisters of Mercy for performing the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And now, among all her other duties, Catherine would spend much of that decade writing and revising the rule and constitution of the new congregation, which the Pope would later approve. Now, as you can imagine, <coughs> the formation of a new religious community added multiple layers of complexity to managing the House of Mercy. Upon taking vows, each sister had to provide a dowry that then had to be invested so that the community would have enough income to support her for the rest of her life. And frugality was indispensable to stretch limited resources to provide the works of mercy to as many people as possible. In addition, Catherine was now responsible for the religious formation of novices, as well as the personal management of both sisters and laywomen. Fortunately, she became adept at identifying 
developing and utilizing each individual's skills to maximum benefit. In a memoir known as the Dublin Manuscript, Sister Mary Claire Augustine Moore described the necessity of record keeping and managing financial accounts as, quote, a most troublesome duty, especially after the parish priest requested that donations from church poor boxes be used to feed the poor at the House of Mercy. It was therefore a blessing to have lay associates with accounting and business skills. In writing of the lay women who joined the Mercy effort, Sister Mary Vincent Hartman explained, from their practical knowledge of business, they were very valuable in carrying out the directions in the House of Mercy. Others were helpful with household chores, sewing, cooking, doing laundry, and sending messages. In addition to the sisters and lay associates, Solomon notes that Catherine also oversaw the 80 poorly paid nurses who worked in shifts and who, at this point in nursing history, were better at mopping floors than at patient care. And taking care of their own health was also important. Savage relates, in consequence of the poor diet, many of the sisters who were greatly overworked as well as undernourished, fell seriously ill with violent scurvy. Get this. Catherine called in the Surgeon General, Sir Philip Crompton, and having less faith in medicine than in management, he ordered beer for the sisters. <laughs> now, we don't know if this cured them, but it may have lifted their spirits. <laughs> Similarly, during the cholera epidemic of 1832, when the sisters worked in hospitals, the Archbishop of Dublin, quote, ordered that their daily nourishment should be greatly increased and recommended port wine and mutton chops. During the same period, Catherine's skills as a hospital administrator did not go unnoticed. Dr. Hart, the chief physician at the Townsend Street Hospital, gave Catherine substantial managerial authority over the hospital and attributed the exceptional recovery rates to her administrative abilities. Now she also needed to master fundraising for the House of Mercy. Beginning in 1832, she initiated an annual bazaar to raise money and wrote the advertisements herself. Sullivan notes, in this and other bazaars, Catherine would show herself to be a skilled public relations and development officer. Catherine wrote to the Duchess of Kent in England, requesting that she and her daughter donate items for the bazaar, which they did. So for several years, the bazaars featured trinkets handmade by the woman who would soon become England's Queen Victoria. And yet, several years later, Regan and Keiss note, realistic about fundraising activities, her sharp business eye evaluated Baggett Street's Bazaar of 1838 as having ended its usefulness as a source of revenue. So Catherine determined to build a public laundry adjoining the House of Mercy, which, in soliciting work from fashionable households of the neighborhood, would both generate income and provide training to unskilled young women. Yet another business venture. Catherine even seems to have understood economies of scale. When the laundry was operational, she wrote, the expense of coal is very great, but the fire will not cost more when the work is much increased, as the hot closet must be prepared for a large or small quantity. And she adapted in other ways as well. Sister Mary Jeremy Daigler notes, within nine years, the original pre-employment training programs had expanded and acquired more academic characteristics. By 1836, the House of Mercy was acknowledged as a teacher training center. As word spread of the work being done by the Sisters of Mercy in Dublin, other communities across Ireland and England began asking Catherine to establish similar houses of mercy. 
In some places, <coughs> conditions were even worse than in Dublin. Savage notes, quote, In no Irish city was the contrast so marked between the good and bad quarters as in Limerick. An English traveler wrote, a person entering the city would infallibly set down Limerick as the very vilest town he had ever entered. In at least three quarters of the hovels, there was no furniture save an iron pot. No table, no chairs, no bench, no bedstead. The inhabitants were, some of them, old, crooked, and diseased. Some younger, but emaciated, and surrounded by starving children. Some were sitting upon the damp ground, and many were unable to rise from their little straw heaps. In scarcely one hovel could I find even a potato." End quote. These cities really needed the Sisters of Mercy. And by 1841, Catherine would open foundations in more than a dozen such towns in Ireland and England, and even more schools than Houses of Mercy. In doing so, she had to consider where the convent would be located, whether there would be enough financial support in the town, and whether she could afford to reassign experienced personnel from Dublin to establish the new community. As she did so, she experienced tremendous turnover of personnel, and it then became necessary to recruit and train and evaluate increasing numbers of sisters and lay women. And once a decision had been made to found a new community, Catherine negotiated with architects, builders, and craftsmen to design and erect buildings, specifying the number and sizes and purpose of rooms, as well as the design of custom-made furniture and other household items, right down to the smallest details, because in those days, one didn't just buy furniture at Sears. And each new foundation also required publicity. Although Catherine reportedly had an utter dislike of crowds and publicity, Regan and Kais remark, to call attention to the nature and purpose of the new community, profession and reception ceremonies were scheduled promptly as public occasions. Ahead of her time in recognizing the value of a media event, Catherine knew that this created awareness among those who could give financial backing, <coughs> those who could encourage others to join the congregation, and most importantly, those who could learn to expect and welcome the Sisters of Mercy. In London, for example, Catherine wrote, on the morning of the ceremony, the church, which accommodates 4,000, was crowded to excess. The seats next to the sanctuary were filled with the nobility. in part because travel and communication among the cities was slow in the 19th century, Catherine established a decentralized management structure in which the local bishop, not Catherine or her successors, would have the formal authority over the local foundation. The decentralization also helped in recruiting new members and engaging local donors. Yet as the number of foundations increased and the distances between them expanded, she traveled increasingly and conducted extensive correspondence with each community. She had to remain aware of events in each location. She kept them focused on their mission, and she relayed news primarily through handwritten letters. Now, you've heard of an exception that proves the rule. Even in describing Catherine's business failures, her biographers have uniformly praised her customary business ability. In discussing a lawsuit brought against her in Kingstown, for example, Savage notes, in this manner, she had not acted with her usual sound business sense. And as the number of communities grew, it also became increasingly necessary to develop leadership skills among the sisters. Sullivan writes, an amazing but little noted feature of Catherine McCauley's leadership was her capacity to develop other female leaders by the undramatic means of patience, encouragement, and affection. 
These were women who were much younger than she, and unaccustomed to negotiating directly with bishops, priests, or lay people. Skilled at household tasks and ministry among poor people, they were at first fearful and hesitant about business matters. For example, Catherine herself wrote to Sister Frances Ward in 1838. As to Sister Elizabeth Moore, we never send forward such a faint-hearted soldier. She will do all interior and exterior work, but to meet on business, confer with the bishop, conclude with a sister, you might as well send the child that opens the door. She gets white as death and her eyes like fever." End quote. And yet, with Catherine's encouragement, that same sister, Elizabeth Moore, eventually took on leadership roles and ultimately served as Mother Superior in Limerick, the very vilest town in Ireland, for 24 years from 1838 until 1862. And from there, she founded 12 additional houses of mercy, including those in Glasgow and Edinburgh in Scotland. In each of these ways, Catherine exhibited the skills of a corporate executive. Indeed, she was well aware that she was launching and managing an international business enterprise and often referred to it as such. Writing in 1839 to her closest confidant, Sister Frances Ward, the former business manager at Baggett Street, who was then in Carlo, Catherine suggested somewhat facetiously, I fear I am in danger of getting a little jealous. Poor Baggett Street is outdone if you make a foundation already. I may retire from business, and certainly without making a fortune. In March of 1840, she wrote to Sister Elizabeth Moore, when I think rest is coming, business only seems to commence. And shortly before her death, in 1841, Catherine wrote a lengthy letter to the sisters in London, which has become known as the Spirit of the Institute. In it, she stated, though the spirit of prayer and retreat should be most dear to us, yet it must be such a spirit as would never draw us from those works of mercy, spiritual and corporal, which constitute the business of our lives. Indeed, Regan and Kais refer to Catherine as being, among many other things, a woman of business whose practicality involved objective management of resources. And Savage notes, characteristically, her last extant letter is a business letter to her solicitor concerning a small legacy that had been left to her for baggage fee, <coughs> but had not yet been paid. A settlement followed promptly. So let's turn now to the legacy that Catherine McCauley has left us. At the time of Catherine Macaulay's death in 1841, there were approximately 100 Sisters of Mercy. Half a century later, there were some 8,000. By 1931, there were more than 18,000 in communities worldwide, with nearly 2,400 novices. Together, they cared for 13,000 orphans, 193,000 hospital patients, and more than 373,000 students in schools. By the middle of the 20th century, there were nearly 24,000 Sisters of Mercy in more than 1,500 convents across the globe, making Mercy the second largest sisterhood in the Catholic Church and the largest congregation in the world established by an English-speaking Catholic. But over the next six decades, the congregation's membership declined by about 60%, falling to 13,600 at the end of the 20th century, and roughly 9,000 today. As a consequence, the institutions sponsored by the Sisters of Mercy, not unlike those sponsored by other religious orders and congregations, are increasingly being staffed by laypersons. And I think this is very important. Because in a sense, this shift toward the lady 
moves us back toward Catherine's original vision for the House of Mercy, to be staffed by devout but secular individuals. Today, the Sisters of Mercy are organized into seven national or supranational units and two local units working in more than 40 countries around the world. The Mercy organizations worldwide include schools, colleges and universities, and other education projects, hospitals, addiction treatment centers, convalescent homes, hospice centers, and other health organizations, orphanages, homeless shelters, and housing facilities, job training centers, legal resource centers, magazines and music ministries, refugee resettlements, environmental projects, volunteer corps, spirituality, theology, and retreat centers, and more. In the Americas alone, the Sisters of Mercy sponsored 200 health care facilities, second only to the Veterans Administration, more than a dozen colleges, 58 schools, 60 social service units, and 13 retreat centers. In fact, the Sisters of Mercy are so famous that they've even inspired the name of a British rock and roll band. <laughs> Now the final part of this presentation looks at the relationship between these mercy endeavors and the educational preparation that we provide to students in business. I have suggested, hopefully convincingly, that Mother Macaulay was, among other things, a business leader. And the works of mercy have been largely institutionalized in businesses. By that I mean organizations that engage in commerce as providers of services to those who need them. Our schools and colleges, hospitals, counseling centers, homeless shelters, job training centers, and other social service agencies are all fundamentally businesses and have to operate on business principles regardless of whether they are nonprofit agencies or for-profit organizations. Regardless of whether their revenue comes in the form of direct payments, such as tuition, or third-party payments, like insurance, or donations, all such institutions require the application of managerial processes to operate efficiently and effectively. I would go so far as to say that without proper attention to accounting and finance, information systems, budgeting, borrowing, investing, hiring, scheduling, personnel development, logistics, motivation, leadership and governance, contract law, advertising, promotion and public relations, and other business functions. Without all that, these organizations designed to promote the works of mercy would be unsustainable. So business administration is and always has been necessary to any enterprise engaged in the corporal and spiritual works of mercy that lie at the heart of the mercy ministries. So the business programs at Mercy campuses have a responsibility to help ensure a supply of graduates who are prepared to carry out the Mercy mission with business expertise. But at the same time, the Mercy charism can and does inspire the business education that we provide so that our graduates and our business practices remain ethical and compassionate and merciful. To investigate this further, I recently surveyed my counterparts at other Mercy business programs to inquire how their business programs seek, out, seek to carry out the Mercy mission. As you probably know, there are 16 colleges and universities belonging to the Conference for Mercy Higher Education in the US. Collectively, our business programs educate more than 5,500 business majors annually and employ more than 150 full-time faculty members. They offer more than 80 undergraduate majors and concentrations, more than 20 minors, 15 certificates, and 16 master's degrees. And we had a 100% response rate 
all of the business programs responded to a short questionnaire regarding the various ways that they promote the Mercy identity. And the survey was then supplemented by information that was available on the websites. Um, the results were published last year in the Journal of Catholic Higher Education, and, and these are some of the findings. Three quarters of the business units have established mission statements or objectives that explicitly or implicitly reference the Mercy context. At UDM, for example, ours says the College of Business Administration prepares diverse students to serve business organizations and society with competence, compassion, and conscience. Rooted in the Jesuit and Mercy traditions, the college champions academic excellence and good character by encouraging intellectual, spiritual, ethical, and social growth. And at Marion Court, graduates of the program will apply standards of ethical and legal behavior to business situations encompassing the mercy core values of compassion, integrity, justice, and service. Now in some schools, these mission statements are disseminated on websites, on syllabi, and promotional literature. At Carlo, framed copies of the mission statement are hung in offices and public spaces. At several institutions, the mission statement is used in strategic planning and assurance of learning processes. Another mechanism that we've used to public, publicly demonstrate a commitment to business that serves the, the common good is endorsement of the principles of responsible management education promulgated by the United Nations. Signatories agree that inclusivity, sustainability, and global social responsibility will be incorporated into the teaching, research, and service components. While embracing diversity and welcoming members of other faiths, we can and do search for candidates who are willing to contribute to the Mercy mission, and then provide employees with resources for ongoing professional development in this respect. Two-thirds of the business units at Mercy campuses reported that business faculty had attended events within the past three years to develop a greater appreciation of their Catholic heritage or the Mercy charism including lectures, conferences, and mission retreats. For example, the business unit at Salve Regina annually co-sponsors a faculty collegium on teaching at Catholic institutions. Scholarship on subjects such, subjects such as social entrepreneurship, business ethics, corporate social responsibility, sustainable production methods, or racial and gender equality in business can also support the mission. At UDM, we've estimated that 15 to 20 percent of our faculty research is directly related to the mission. Examples of recent topics from our business school include ethical issues in bankruptcy, corporate social responsibility, service learning and leadership, using principles of Catholic social thought to evaluate business activities, catalytic social entrepreneurship to combat desperate poverty, and integrating Catholic social teaching into the business curriculum, among others. Additionally, as one respondent to the survey from the College of St. Mary noted, even where the topic is not explicitly mission-oriented, faculty research is often strongly influenced by Mercy Values. In addition, our business faculty serve as editorial board members and manuscript reviewers for several mission-oriented publications, such as the Journal of Management, Spirituality, and Religion, and the Journal of Management and Sustainability. In terms of curriculum, each of the Mercy Business programs places a strong emphasis on business ethics and social responsibility. Two-thirds initiate this coverage through a core course, three-quarters weave ethics throughout the curriculum, and nearly half use both approaches. But going beyond business ethics, Mercy Business programs frequently integrate Catholic social teaching into the curriculum. Engaging <coughs> students and faculty in a dialogue on social justice issues such as the rights of workers, global income inequality, 
the stewardship of natural resources, and the preferential option for the poor. At several institutions, this is covered in a campus-wide course, and in others, the business programs themselves have taken the lead. The business department at Misericordia, for example, has organized a symposium on Catholic social teaching and presents it in its economics courses. It's woven throughout the business curriculum at St. Xavier and Mount Mercy, where the emphasis is on sustainability. In some units, the capstone business policy course or elective courses address specific Catholic social teaching issues such as inclusiveness and sustainable development. At least seven institutions, including UDM, offer business programs focused on the management of healthcare institutions. One offers a business education program for teachers. UDM offers a graduate certificate in ethical leadership. And five, including UDM, offer forensic accounting, which equips students to detect and prevent fraud. In some business programs, a gateway course includes writing assignments in which students reflect on the Mercy Charism. At Mount Mercy, for example, a business professor teaches a course that explores the life and work of Catherine Macaulay and the subsequent history of the Sisters of Mercy. At Carlo, the mission statement is discussed in the first year experience course where students receive a tour of the Mother House and watch a film about the mission and history of the Sisters of Mercy. And outside of the curriculum, we offer an annual mission retreat for first-year business students here in the business, uh, business school at UDM. And we strongly encourage business students to participate in UDM's annual ethics poll. Now, you know service learning, in which students use the skills developed in the classroom, classroom to serve the community, is mandatory at a number of Mercy institutions, either as a component of a core course or as a graduation requirement that students can fulfill at any time. Two-thirds of the Mercy Business programs have adopted service learning courses, either as requirements or electives. At UDM, it's required of all business students, both undergraduates and graduate students. Examples of projects include financial literacy lessons and volunteer income tax assistance. Mount Aloysius estimated the savings to the community were over $40,000 over three years from tax assistance. While UDM received a 2014 Spirit of Detroit Award from the City Council for the same program. Other examples include a grant writing elective at Mount Aloysius in which students assist nonprofit agencies in obtaining grants. Salve Regina students in human resource management teach resume writing and interviewing skills to neighborhood residents at community centers. And students taking a management elective in dispute resolution at Mount Mercy conduct a good sports day in which grammar school students are introduced to the idea of good sportsmanship. And you know that service learning typically requires both civic engagement and written reflection on the experience, which can be linked directly to the Mercy Charism. Warrington et al. studied the service learning reflections of business majors at Salve Regina and concluded, in addition to their business skills, students in the service learning programs practice mercy, kindness, patience, and compassion. Sabaji, Kavanaugh, and Hipston found that after service learning, finance students at UDM exhibited significantly higher interest in seven out of seven social justice issues and registered improvements on 8 out of 10 leadership dimensions. UDM's College of Business Administration now offers an endowed Kavanaugh Scholarship to recognize and support business students engaged in the most meaningful service learning. And aside from service learning, other community outreach includes clothing drives, mentoring at-risk youth, meals and gifts for the needy, building and repairing homes, work at homeless shelters, neighborhood revitalization projects, assistance to charities, and so forth. At Salve Regina, for example, marketing students have created promotional campaigns for causes such as skin cancer prevention and organ donation. Roughly half of the Mercy Business Schools have external advisory boards, and several, including ours, 
include Sisters of Mercy or other religious as members. Business alumni and alumnae are frequently involved in promoting the mission through community outreach and what I call inreach, giving back to the institution. Some do this as mentors who nurture, nurture the next generation of Mercy business students. Many provide internship opportunities and guest lectures that address issues of faith and justice. They also fund the social outreach programs at many campuses. Several members of religious communities have graduated from Mercy Business programs. A recent example at UDM is Father Anthony Kafawa. Other graduates have gone on to live out the Mercy charism as laypersons in the business world. Many have entered careers in healthcare and education. Others serve on nonprofit boards. Some have established charitable foundations, and others direct environmental sustainability efforts at corporations. Some UDM examples include Eric Hespenheim, who served as Deloitte Touche's global leader on climate change and sustainability, and Jean Paul Meuccio, director of sustainability at Global Advanced Metals. Still, other Mercy Business alums are social entrepreneurs in their own right. As Myra Edelstein of Salve Regina noted, there is a strong sense of social entrepreneurship among the alumni. Some UDM examples include Katie Goddard, founder of the I Can Create Change Academy, Stephanie Clark, who founded two nonprofits empowering women and girls, Terrence Wheeler, who founded a sports philanthropy firm that helps athletes and entertainers achieve social goals, and Gabriela Santiago Romero currently a UDM business major who launched a micro-lending project here on Livernoy Avenue. I'd like to conclude with just a few final comments. As a fitting tribute to Catherine McCauley's legacy, <clears throat> the Irish five-pound note featured her image from 1994 until the turn of the century when Ireland replaced its national currency with the euro. She's also appeared on Irish postage stamps. But as we've seen, her legacy touches the entire world and continues well into the 21st century. And as the Mercy institutions become increasingly staffed by laypersons, it's really up to us to become those dedicated, secular individuals that Catherine first recruited to the works of Mercy. I think it's useful to periodically refresh our understanding of that tradition and reflect on how our jobs contribute to the overall Mercy mission and how the Mercy charism can inspire our work. I hope this presentation has uh, contributed to that effort. Uh, and I think that an ongoing engagement with our colleagues at other Mercy universities can suggest practices that we might want to employ. In fact, ideally, I would hope that this exercise could be replicated by other types of mercy organizations, including high schools and hospitals, and even organizations sponsored by other types of religious uh, orders and, and communities.